Great. Thank you, Cash. And Cash is our IT voice behind the scenes. So we're, we're thrilled that she's able to uh, walk us through some of those technical uh, components of today's webinar. So please use the, use the Q&A window if you have questions, chat window if you have some tech questions and those sort of things. And we will do our best as we go through today's webinar to respond to your questions. We really are challenged not to have this. It's unfortunate it can't be necessarily unmute you and have you ask your questions live. We have um, a lot of folks approaching 400 uh, call-in folks on today's webinar. So the interest in today's topic is certainly widespread throughout our network, which certainly isn't surprising. Um, again, my name is Denise Harlow. I'm the Senior Director of Training and Technical Assistance here at the Community Action Partnership and also Project Director for the Organizational Standards Center of Excellence. And I'm joined here today by Seth Hassett, who's the Director of the Division of State Assistance at the Office of Community Services at the Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, so to start us off, I'm going to turn it over to uh, Seth Hassett to welcome us. Okay, good, good morning and, um, and thank you, Denise, and all the uh, staff at, uh, at Community Action Partnership for, for uh, organizing this webinar. And uh, we have several staff from the Office of Community Services here uh, today as well and are online on the webinar. We're really excited to, um, to join everyone today for this webinar. Uh, our director, Jeannie Chaffin, is on travel today, but she's indicated um, in so many communications that as uh, we commemorate our 50th anniversary of the war on poverty, uh, this is a critical opportunity to take stock and um, we commit to the uh, standards and values that have uh, guided this network for so many years. Um, she's outlined some priorities for us as we look in this area of performance management and accountability. And the three areas that we've focused on have been, first, how do we make uh, sure we have high performing organizations with the capacity to provide high quality services to all Americans who are struggling to move into the middle class. Next, we need to make sure that organizations at the federal, state, and local levels uh, have systems of accountability to demonstrate results. And finally, we just want to pursue greater levels of impact for all of the individuals, families, and communities we serve. And one step, of course, in assuring uh, that we meet these challenges is to communicate comprehensive, rigorous, and consistent standards to the organizations that receive funds and have the responsibility for anti-poverty efforts in communities across the country. As you know, OCS uh, issued a draft memorandum, information memoranda on March 24th on the topic of organizational standards. And we took the unusual step uh, in uh, issuing that IM of, of draft, of issuing it in draft form. And we did that because we considered this to be a very critical document and one that requires input and involvement from all levels of the CSBG network. We really want this effort to be a success. And uh, it's our assessment that states not only have the authority, but also the responsibility to communicate standards for all eligible entities and to monitor against those standards. However, it's also important that any standards be implemented in a collaborative manner. And the goal is to assure that we are successful at all, at, in all communities in having the capacity to deliver high quality services. And we also have reiterated in multiple occasions that local standards must also be complemented by high uh, expectations of accountability at state and local levels. The organizational standards that we're describing today are part of a, a larger effort to assure accountability at all levels, local, state, and federal, and additional guidance will be forthcoming on other elements of this effort. Uh, we will be talking more today about the opportunity for comments, but one, the one thing that I would reiterate uh, as a takeaway from our level is that we very much want to encourage that during this period of comment that there be uh, states and state associations and the networks that they serve uh, take the opportunity to communicate about how this might look in, the, in, in, a, in your state. Uh, what are the potential challenges? What are the legal rulemaking and other requirements that need to be put into place? 
and use this opportunity for comment to, to let us know uh, how feasible the, the recommendations we have are. Um, and the last thing I will say is we are not, we did send out a dear colleague message, I believe yesterday, that indicated that the uh, states are not going to be asked to submit a formal uh, detailed report on the organizational standards in the next uh, state assessment, but we'll have, I mean, in the next state plan process, but will be in the following year. And the one thing I will say about that is, as you read these standards, as you read the IM, this is a process that um, we want to be done uh, properly, done in conjunction with state rules, and with a timeline and training and technical assistance and other support to assure that it's successful. And we want this to be done the right way. And so uh, the fact that we won't be requiring a, uh, a detailed write-up in the next state plan uh, does not mean that the effort shouldn't be starting uh, now uh, in order to get these things ready and implemented and to have the, uh, something to fully report on in the next round. So with that, I'll hand over to Denise. And again, thank you so much for all the work that you've done in um, bringing us to this point in the effort and uh, for pulling this uh, together. Thanks, Seth. Uh, and we're glad to be able to walk through the content of the IM um, during today's webinar to make sure everyone across the network has an, a chance to, to hear it, uh, to pose questions, again, in the Q&A window or the chat window. And um, we'll talk a bit more about that Dear Colleague letter that came out yesterday. If you haven't seen that Dear Colleague letter, shoot us an email and we'll make sure it gets to you. It's nice to have the clarification, but hearing uh, Seth talk about that, that's not a time for us to pause. It's time for us to really ramp up and get our, our ducks in a row, as it were, uh, to be ready to rock, as I tend to say in the field, on, on standards as quickly as possible. So um, let's, let's dive in, and um, hopefully if you have your IM handy, um, it is in draft format, but hopefully you'll have that with you and we can, can talk about it. Today we do want to talk about what those core components of the draft IM say. Um, we'll do our best to try to talk about what they mean, perhaps, as well, um, and, and how that's going to impact both um, agencies and states, as well as associations. I do like to encourage folks that, in addition to that tool, having the Dear Colleague Letter with the draft federal and state accountability measures is a nice thing to kind of have in tandem when you're looking at these documents. They do kind of really go together in terms of uh, how, the, how the network will be reading these materials. We definitely want to encourage the network to Embrace this uh, feedback opportunity. We'll talk a bit more about that. Uh, comments are due by April 25th to Latoya Smith at HHS at OCS. So we encourage you to read the document, provide feedback directly to OCS. We'll talk a little bit about some next steps as well. And then we want to talk a little bit about tools and resources uh, to help the network move, move the needle here on, on toward full implementation. Yeah. I always like to start the presentations using uh, the um, slide I think that uh, OCS developed about it a little over a year ago that really walks out the major milestones of the, of the three-pronged effort here with uh, the Performance Management Task Force working on the federal and state accountability measures with the Urban, Urban Institute, the partnerships work on organizational standards, and NASCAP's NASCAP's important work on Roman Next Generation. Uh, we are still kind of in quarter four here. We're kind of extending that out uh, beyond the slide, but it's nice to show that we have seen progress over the course of the last year, and a lot of work has taken place. And it's nice to kind of be on the cusp of, uh, we were talking that it was exciting to have this webinar here today because it really is things getting off the ground and, and moving forward. Next slide, please. All right, as many of you know, that the organizational standards were submitted in July to the Office of Community Services. It is posted up on our website. Uh, the document does have a broad executive summary, a bit of the history of the process, and then it dives into the 56 organizational standards in the three categorical areas of maximum feasible participation, vision and direction, and operations and accountability. So if you haven't seen that document, and I'm sure the vast majority of you have, it is available up on our website. Next slide. Here's just a picture, again, of the draft IM. You'll see it is in draft form. There's no final date on this. And as we've heard Jeannie talk about as well, um, IM 49, I believe, is a, a, another large critical uh, IM that came out to the network in draft form because they're really wanting to reflect the spirit and nature of the standards process of, of true network engagement. Let's go to the next slide, please. So 
Um, in the draft I am, again, there's, it, it came out in the Dear Colleague letter on March 24th. We have, again, a month for feedback. And in addition to the text, we have several appendices, again, that we'll be talking a bit about here. There's a nice table in the back, and Seth was referencing the, the, the need for states and agencies and associations to think about rolling this out and starting the process now. And the table in the back of the IM, I think, really does give us a nice outline on how to do that. All right, so let's dive in. So the draft IM does provide uh, guidance to the CSBG network on implementing the organizational standards by states. Um, now, it does talk about OCS seeking authority to pursue implementation of national standards uh, for CSBG via uh, changes in legislative authority. Uh, but currently, they're able to be voluntarily implemented, and that voluntary implementation, uh, given the wording in the IM and what we heard Jeannie earlier this week at the Roman Inn Service, certainly does not need to be delayed. Um, it can be rolled out now. We see the progress that the network needs to be making and has made over the last year. But again, there's no, no reason to really pause the process right now, but that OCS is pursuing uh, the legislative authority for national standards. And it is nice to see in the IM a reflection that it was a collaborative effort, really, to develop these organizational standards, that it really tried to um, imbibe the true nature of community action at the local, state, and federal levels with the CSBG working group, with its 50-plus members from all aspects of the network, continuous feedback loops as the standards were developed, and both whether it's via web, um, virtual in-person meetings, or actually being out in the field with many folks or across the country, we hope that you really felt that it, that it was an engaging process. So um, as it states in the IM, they do reference what they're calling the COE standards, the Center of Excellence Organizational Standards. So a lot of those terms are used interchangeably, but they are that is the document that was submitted in July with those 56 standards. And it does state in the IM that uh, these standards have been established to ensure that eligible entities have the capacity to provide high quality services to low income families and communities. It's trying to, again, set that baseline that all thousand plus cap agencies are able to document a certain level of capacity. Um, we all know capacity doesn't guarantee something on the other side, but it does give us, we believe, that core element that it's going to give us the um, network wide ability to be responsive, to provide high quality services uh, that low income families in our communities truly deserve. And I'm getting a lot of phone calls and emails. What changed in the draft IM on the org standards? So we want to make sure we clarify what's in the draft IM with the 56 standards. The verbiage has not changed. That information is as it was submitted um, in July. So if you're laying documents side by side, don't freak out if you don't see something different. It, it is identical. So great. All right, so let's get into timing. And Seth referenced a, that a, a little bit as well in that, that I am, or the, draft, or the Dear Colleague letter, excuse me, that came out yesterday, I think also helped to provide some additional clarification on some timing here. But the I am does talk about OCS expecting states to report on the establishment and implementation of work standards no later than federal fiscal year 2016, and most importantly, in coordination with local eligible entities, local CAP agencies, however you want to frame that up, in order to increase accountability for eligible entities across the country. So all state CSPG lead agencies are encouraged to review the standards. And this is some of my interesting context to see in a, in a, in a draft I am to proceed immediately uh, to, to with plans to coordinate with partners in the state to establish and implement the organizational standards. So the IAM does convey that, yes, 2016 is the target date, but it does convey the sense of urgency and the need to start the mo moving the process along now. So that proceed immediately language is, is pretty pretty direct, so that's good. And please pause me at any time if there's any place you'd like to go. Sure. So. All right, so if not these, then what? Um, under current state's authorities, um, states currently have the ability, as we've been talking about for the last year and a half, to implement monitoring, to implement standards, and they have an obligation to hold agencies accountable. So if a state establishes a different set of standards, which under the draft IM is the option to do so, those standards must encompass uh, the comprehensive requirements of the, of the CSBG Act and other federal requirements. For instance, what's found in OMB circulars uh, and those sorts of things, and they need to be at least as rigorous and as comprehensive as the Center of Excellence developed um, organizational standards. So under current state's authorities, you need to do standards, so either you can use the Center of Excellence standards or, under current state's authorities, develop your own set 
But again, they need to be comprehensive. They need to encompass, again, the, the act, OMB circulars, uh, those comprehensive requirements. And then again, in guidance and with support of your, of your statewide network. And OCS will implement new procedures for state reporting on organizational and um, standards and upcoming CSDG plans and annual reports. And again, many of you have seen that in those draft state and federal accountability measures that have been out for comment. And I believe that comment period ends today. So get those comments in uh, today, if at all possible. But there will be some procedures coming out. There'll be technical assistance. And with that 10-1-2016 kind of target date, um, we know we have some time to really help make that a, um, a really good, strong process. <clears throat> so again, under current state's authorities, OCS is saying yes, standards can be rolled out under a voluntary aspect. Uh, here, lead agencies have the authority to establish and monitor goals, standards, and requirements that again, assure an appropriate level of accountability and quality among the state's eligible entities. And again, as we know, in a block grant environment, what happens in one state can be different than what happens in another. But we all know how we're, how we're challenged as a network to really demonstrate our high level of accountability. And I think we've been talking from day one, these standards are really meant to raise the vote across the country so all agencies, all eligible entities are performing at, at a certain threshold that we're able then to talk about, to kind of hang our hat on a bit and to, to uh, describe the capacity of our network. Um, in order to meet the Act's responsibilities, again, the IM states, all state CSBG lead agencies must establish and communicate standards and requirements. Critical areas are based on the requirements of the Act and the values of community action. And again, here's where you see them itemizing those nine areas, uh, consumer input involvement, community engagement, and community assessment. Some of those things are the piece that get really those staff uh, values and unique to community action. Then we get to see organizational leadership, board governance, strategic planning, HR, some of those nuts and bolts capacity um, components, financial operations and oversight. And then that data and analysis piece we know will cross over quite a bit with what Roman Next Gen is doing. But all of that really kind of encompasses the breadth um, of the work that the network is doing. And again, here's all a, a state may establish and communicate a different set of standards. Again, the IM reiterates several times that they need to be as rigorous and as comprehensive as the Center of Excellence developed standards. And again, must encompass uh, the requirements of the Act, federal requirements. And again, hit those nine areas. And I would probably argue even hit the 56 areas. So if the state wanted to modify something or pull something out, there would need to be dialogue. Um, why, how, what's either being tightened up even further or what's being modified and perhaps rephrased differently based on an individual state's needs. So OCS expectations. And what we've been hearing from Jeannie in the field and Seth in the field repeatedly is that it really needs to be a, um, a collaborative process for this rollout. We really want it to be a fair and reasonable process across all components of the CSBG network. Um, that it should allow from input from the boards, from the staff, of community action agencies, from state agencies, from state associations. Let's talk about how we do this as, as a network. And I think we know where, where the groups are coming together well, we are seeing success um, in the field. And again, if agencies are going to supplement uh, the organizational standards in some ways, again, they need to do that again in, in similar fashion, in collaboration um, within their states uh, with agencies and associations. All right, um, organizational standards need to be clearly communicated prior to state monitoring activities and consistently reiterated in state plans. Hence, I think why we've seen some clarification language in the Dear Colleague letter from yesterday, just making sure that there's time in place so that uh, contracts can be developed um, with appropriate language, that state plans can be clear and communicated directly to agencies about what the expectations are, that states have time to go to their own legal counsel, to their own state rules and regulations, that process can be significant um, at a state level to make sure all the ducks legally are in a row. So a lot of those things are, there's a window here to make sure those things happen. But once established, once we kind of get those ducks in a row, those standards, if they're going to be modified again, um, really to any future process needs to also be communicated publicly, communicated transparently, and in dialogue with their state network. If, if I could just add on that, I think that uh, by the, the process of 
communicating the standards early um, allows local agencies, local eligible entity community action agencies to begin their own process of self-assessment, looking at the degree to which they are meeting the standards or uh, what needs to be done to, to reach those standards before they are formally established and communicated. Um, this provides the opportunity across the state for an effort uh, to, to begin work on the standards uh, before they become a, uh, a formally established with, within the state rules and systems. And so that's another, uh, another part of the, by putting these out and having them available, uh, uh, local agencies should begin to work with them uh, at this point. Mm -hmm. Definitely, and seeing some of the, the chats coming in through and, and talking about some of the timing of this and, and getting this draft IM out now certainly gives the network the call to action, the, the need to move forward. We're, we're getting the pieces in, in our own ducks in a row as, an, as a national network. All right, monitoring corrective action and reduction of funding and termination. Everyone's favorite slide header, I'm sure. Uh, this is not something necessarily that uh, we, we – isn't the favorite part of the process, but the monitoring piece is really that other core element. And we know our organizations are highly accountable. We know the OMB statutes and regulations put a, bar, a very high bar on our organization. We also know states are in the field, they're monitoring, they have finance monitors, they're having program monitors. There really is that partnership in the field to make sure agencies are accountable. Um, I know some of you feel that oftentimes there's a, a monitor in your office every day, perhaps over the course of a year, depending on your various funding streams. But your CSBG, CSBG monitors play a unique role, right? They, they look at the entire organization, and again, these standards really encompass the entire organization's um, capacity practices, um, if it were. So here, states monitor whether an eligible entity meets established goals, standards, and requirements under the current act. However, if as a result, state determines that an eligible entity has deficiencies, then a state must assess whether technical assistance is warranted, provide the needed training and technical assistance, and require or possibly require a corrective action plan um, based on the QIP or quality improvement plan. Sometimes I use QIP and corrective action plan interchangeably with one another, uh, but it's really requiring that corrective action plan based on, on that QIP. Now, failure to meet multiple requirements or standards may reflect widespread or systematic issues uh, that cannot feasibly be corrected within a reasonable time frame. Sometimes if an agency is struggling at, at a certain level, um, in such cases, SAGE may um, consider additional actions that may be necessary, including reduction or termination of funding. So folks often say, well, is this then where if I miss a standard, how does that fit into my monitoring and when do I kind of trip this wire a little bit going down that QIP or corrective action plan? And I'll maybe say, this is Denise speaking at the Community Action Partnership, not OCS, but um, the way we've been reading, and I think it's the next slide uh, that talks a little bit more about specifically here that it really kind of tries to get at the, the two ends of the spectrum. Um, that if there is a failure to meet, let's go to the end of this first bullet first. If there's a failure to meet a single requirement or a single standard, it's most likely going to be appropriate for technical assistance and training, maybe some renegotiation of some performance goals. One or two missed standards is going to, you know, we're, we're human beings, right? Organizations are not perfect. We're going to ebb and flow over the course of our years. So some, some things, well, there may be bumps along the road. But if we go to that first part, that clear instances of organizational fraud, systematic abuse of, it, of funds or criminal activity, there may be some immediate action. And I would guess um, there's no one on, this, on the call today who would disagree with that. If we see agencies truly, truly in crisis, it's not so much they would go down the road certainly for de-designation, but some significant help. The action needs to happen quickly. We want our agencies to be strong and stable, and if this agency stumbles, we want to support them and, and re-engage them and re-energize them to be successful organizations. And our hope as a partnership is that all of our agencies in the network will be ready to meet standards and be successful to go down that road. And if I, I'll just add that with regard to this, this, this portion of the, uh, both our IM and this presentation, there's really nothing new about uh, the expectations, what the statute requires, and what we're communicating with regard to monitoring and corrective action. The only thing that's new is that what we're looking to see is that the standards are, you know, m more clearly communicated, clearly established, and consistently implemented uh, across the network. So, but 
that all of this language and all of the expectations that are spelled out here are all grounded in the, the longstanding uh, requirements of the CSBG Act. That's a great point, Seth. And, and you talk about IM 116 in this document. You're right. Nothing has changed or shifted. Um, we, last year, year before last, worked with Catalog to develop a toolkit called Monitoring Map, a CSBG Network's Guide. Basically, it interprets IM-116 for the lay people like me. I have to figure out exactly what that IM says. And again, nothing has shifted. And again, in our recommendations that went in in July, we reflected IM-116 to maintain that process. So there, there are windows of time and guarantees to agencies in terms of opportunities to improve under certain circumstances. So it's a very good point. Now here I think it's an interesting piece that the IM calls out boards. Um, I think that's a vitally important aspect of this IM. Um, we were just chatting this week at the Roma in service that from a legal perspective, especially on the private cap side, the boards of directors are the legal entity. That's what state, that's what um, courts, that's what the public, that's what the media, when they see an organization in trouble or succeeding, they turn to the board of directors. So it's good that the IM here doesn't necessarily call out boards, but it references boards. It says these um, standards really help can help boards uh, kind of do that first line assessment. It's going to be one basis to help boards assess how their organizations are doing. And we're really hoping agencies are keeping their boards of directors apprised of the organizational standards. I know when I've been in the field, I know board members that I run into have heard about it, they're aware of it, they know they're coming, which is very, very good news to hear. And, and how do we figure out um, practical ways for boards to be kept abreast of the organizational standards rollout? And I know in the draft document with the 56 standards, a lot of the documentation ways that agencies demonstrate they meet standards are around board approval, board acceptance, and those pieces are found then in board minutes. So I'm happy to see that the IM reflects that call to action for boards of directors as well. All right, so here's a little bit, uh, I'm gonna go to my screen here because the, the, the font gets a little bit small for me, but again here, um, or states reporting on organizational standards that the upcoming submissions of state CSBG plans will require a description of standards. And I know I've been on phones with state CSBG offices and others saying, does this mean this year or next year? And we've been encouraging folks to be thinking about, if you're doing your state plan now, to be thinking about what language you would be inserting. Is now the chance to really kind of dialogue and test that and work that out with your colleagues to figure out what's going to be the best language uh, to insert the state plans into contracts. But here's specific to states, um, if using the COE standards, states will be asked to describe a timeline for implementation and process for input and reporting from eligible entities and other stakeholders. Timeline, process, collaborative rollout. If they're not using the standards, however, they will be required to explain a reason for using an alternative set of standards, describe those alternative standards, timeline, and reporting procedures, and ensure that those standards are at least as rigorous as the proposed uh, Center of Excellence organizational standards. So a few other steps, um, and it seems in line with the rest of what the IAM is talking about. Here we did add a note for the, from yesterday's Dear Colleague letter, um, and it states, OCS understands that states are beginning to develop state plans and applications for federal fiscal year 2015 funding that are due on September 1, 2014, just a few months from now. The summer will be here before we know it. States may have concerns about whether and how to integrate new accountability and performance management strategies into their plans. Right, because we're starting that dialogue now, that makes sense. Here's the important part. States will not be required to include CSBG org standards, the state accountability measures, or new ROMA reporting requirements in their applications and state plans until federal fiscal year 2016. However, we encourage states to, I would have added a however, but yeah. however, <laughs> uh, we encourage states to prepare for implementation of these accountability and performance strategy, management strategies for fiscal year 2016 and take advantage of training and TA opportunities in the coming months and not to slow the boat. You're really, now is the time to really kind of ramp up those energies, that um, expertise. Um, and if you look at the, the Dear Colleague letter talks about all three components, what we, Federal 10 2016 is going to be a very, very busy day, right? Mm -hmm. There's going to be a lot happening. So now's the time the IM is out on standards or the draft IM is out on standards. We know what the roadmap looks like. Let's get this roadmap taken care of now is how I would interpret uh, that second part of that sentence. Yeah, I would, and just to give another, a little bit of an additional sense of the, with regard to the state plans and what's going to be expected 
we will be working over the next several months to be communicating very clearly what will be uh, what will be expected to be reported in the state plans. And that means we're looking at everything from the model state plans, our guidance, our materials. Um, so we're very, part of the uh, intent here uh, uh, is to be there, that the operative word is required and that in order for the federal government to require certain types of reporting in detail, we have to go through a pretty comprehensive process. So we want to prepare the field for, for that as well. Um, so this is sort of the heads up as to uh, where we're heading, uh, but, but again, we will be also looking at things like the model state plans and how those are communicated and what's expected in there. And allow me to clarify, I think it's 10-1-2015 will be the busy start. Um, 2016 will be, it'll already be rolling out, so all right. Go to the next slide. Um, and it concludes with the same proceed immediately language at the end of the item, and I think it reflects here what Seth was just saying, that um, Local agencies, state agencies are encouraged to review the org standards developed by the Center of Excellence and proceed immediately with plans to coordinate with partners um, in the state on the establishment and implementation of standards. So it's, it's repeated a couple of different times. All right, so we're going to dive here, I think, into um, uh, some of the appendices. Um, the first piece is the state implementation of standards that kind of gives us a roadmap. We'll walk through this and then we'll take a look at some of the questions that are coming in through the chat window. Um, so let's walk through these uh, tables here, um, here for a moment. And again, this is just a roadmap. It's nothing that, um, again, is overly complicated. It's nice to have it laid out to show um, states and entities kind of what the process would look like. Probably the next piece is to take these tables, if I was at a state office, to then add a date column to, to my tool and to figure out when I'm going to be doing each of these possible steps. But the first is initiate discussions with key partners in the state, and I know Many, many states where those conversations have been happening over the last year and a half, this would not be something new. Um, but states convene discussions with eligible entities, the state association, and other partners to discuss the process and timeline for adopting uh, the Center of Excellence Developed Standards. The state then moves into certainly assessing uh, state laws and rulemaking procedures that state CSBG officials, their legal counsel, um, and contracting units uh, review existing state laws, regulations, and contracting procedures to see what needs to be changed, what processes need to happen. Developing public notification um, that after review of current rules and standards, officials um, identify and communicate anticipated standards, timelines, in writing, on websites, getting the communication out uh, to the field. I know you have rules and regulations at the state level to do that in a variety of ways on a number of components already. Uh, it's talking here about doing that on standards specifically. Next slide. Through public meetings then, opportunities for public input on timelines and procedures, um, having public meetings virtually or live, I'm sure. Uh, many states are also moving to virtual meetings, giving uh, challenges of travel budgets and such, um, and written input processes to make sure there's time for folks to reflect, provide feedback to states. Um, provide input from eligible entities, other key stakeholders, boards, uh, associations, and others. In the third, the next one, developing communication of TA strategies. And again, I know we've been talking with a lot of folks when you look at the state and federal accountability measures uh, that are in draft form. There's pieces there around technical assistance strategic plans at state levels as well as at the OCS level. But be thinking about uh, training and technical assistance. And I know many of you have been, and we'll talk a little bit later on this webinar about some tools and resources that exist currently to help agencies already kind of help get to meeting the standards. But in partnership with state and national TA partners, the state establishes and communicates a TA strategy to help assure that all entities have access to technical assistance. And I know we've been talking with some states as well. Um, access to discretionary monies, I know, um, differ state by state. Some states do use their discretionary CSPG resources for technical assistance, either in their own agencies or they sub it out to associations or other technical assistance providers. Some states use their discretionary in various other ways. Um, some states have a 95% right on path through. So this is going to be some challenges that we're going to have to work through as a network to make sure all agencies across the country have some access to TA. And certainly at the national level, CAP law, NASCAS, the partnership, there are a variety of um, partners here who can provide tools and resources as well. So we're happy to work with states 
who may have less flexibility than others to figure out um, how we do this together. And also happy to work with all states um, um, regardless of their level of resources. <clears throat> Um, here, incorporation of uh, standards into the state plan. We've been talking about that here, certainly. But when we're looking at state plans um, that would be put in next summer or developed a year from now, um, those of you developing state plans now, I would struggle with that verbiage now and try to figure it out. And let's, let's work as a network to figure out what language is going to be working and is going to be um, most meaningful uh, to the network. But um, those are going to need to be put into standards. They're going to need to be put into state plans. And, and then eventually into your CAP work plans as well for your agencies. <coughs> Now, this next piece about incorporating standards into local CSBG work plans, agency bylaws, and procedures. Um, we may have some thoughts about um, whether or not standards belong necessarily in agency bylaws, at least from a TA provider perspective. And we'll be providing some of that comment and feedback. But I think what this really tells us is that boards and agencies need to be paying attention to their governance documents. That if the bylaws are the board's roadmap in terms of the rules and regulations they need to follow, we need to make sure bylaws are not in conflict with. And we look at bylaws a lot, and there are always some, there can be some really odd clauses here and there. So now's a good chance to sit back, take a look at your bylaws, see if there are any potential conflicts that may need to be modified or changed. I doubt we'll see a, a vast need to revamp bylaws across the country. We've been having some communications with CAP law about that. But it's good to have that in here, that it's raising and elevating the flag that we're thinking about our governance documents on the eligible entity side of the equation. And finally, assessment and communication of results to making sure the standards are incorporated again into monitoring practices. I know some states are already mod modifying monitoring tools to identify, all right, out of our 100 core questions we use in our monitoring tool, 56, I said those 56 standards are already counted in there some way, shape, or form. Some are adding to monitoring tools if they're kind of voluntary looking, voluntarily looking at these things right now. A lot of different ways that states are doing that. Um, but looking at your monitoring tools is going to be a critical activity. And then again, looking at the corrective action cycle, um, making sure that states identify what noncompliance looks like at their state level, and communicating specifically what happens um, with certain deficiencies when they come up, what the process is for a corrective action plan or a TYP, what the opportunity will be for training and technical assistance, and to, to talk again. None of this is necessarily new, but it's definitely articulating and making sure all parts of the network are kind of paying attention to those aspects of the corrective action cycle. So I think those are the comprehensive components that are in the IM. Let's go to one more slide. I don't think, okay, yes. The remainder of the appendices are the, the 56 standards. They itemize them out for the private agencies, nonprofit caps, and then the public caps are the municipal authorities. And um, certainly we're going to be tightening up numbering and language and things like that because we know when once we separate the two into a separate document, some of the, some of the language may need to be tightened up a little bit. Um, before we move into Q&A, um, Seth, any comments um, so far? Should we jump into taking a look at what the Q&A looks like? No, I think we'd uh, be great to go to the Q&A. Okay, um, we're going to be a bit challenged here because we do have an, um, a couple of different things coming in. Question, what's the best place to go? Is it chat or <coughs> the Q&A window? Chat. All right. Um, for those agencies that did not receive the IM or Dear Colleague letter, how would you secure a copy? Um, the Dear Colleague letters are usually posted on the Office of Community Services website. You can usually Google them pretty easily. The one from yesterday may or may not be up yet. I know sometimes it can take some time. If you don't find them, email me or Cashin. We'll have our emails here at the end of the presentation, and we'll be happy to send you a copy and or a link uh, to that document. Um, I have seen some concerns coming in around the proposed 50% uh, cut that um, as agencies are being challenged by um, uh, shifts in funding and challenges in funding, um, what is the expectation to have the resources to address the standards and to meet the standards? And I, I know we've heard Jeannie talk in the field about the challenges that a 50% cut would have in, on, on, on us as a network and our agency's ability to address the standards, but I also know there's we need to raise the bar. So Seth, any thoughts or comments on that? Um, well, I would just say that we, uh, first of all, I think the, the effort to communicate standards, these are the, uh, across the board, the, the basic, uh, the capacity that we would like to see and uh, in any agency throughout the network and recognizing that CSPG funds are, are a portion of the funds that come to an agency, but that overall this is, uh, this is about the standards to, to meet the anti-poverty uh, uh, mission, 
and within the community. We do know that um, the proposals uh, with regard to the budget uh, have been, as we've seen now over the course of uh, a few years, we have to kind of operate uh, on two fronts. One is recognizing that um, over the last few years, we've had either a, a continuing resolution level or uh, we have not seen a 50% reduction in funding. We've seen essentially consistent uh, levels in terms of congressional appropriations. So we have to operate with sort of a um, awareness of, of both, uh, both areas, the, the president's budget and the, uh, what Congress has appropriated. The only other thing I would say about this is that the ability to make the case and explain the value and quality of work um, moving forward with, with these standards is actually an important ingredient of being able to indicate uh, why uh, why resources are needed for the network and why and that we can assure that across the board um, the funds that are invested uh, meet a high quality a high standard of capacity so um, it's a chicken or egg type of thing, but we, we think that we have to move forward with standards and we have to move forward with the expectation that that's going to be, that also feeds the budget discussion to show that we're making progress and doing good work uh, with the funds that are appropriated to us. Thank you. It is a challenging dual track, but it's something that um, we're having to figure out. Um, a question has come in around the determination around board structure. Certainly um, one of the standards, um, several of the standards around governance, but it certainly re-articulates what's in the states or the, the federal CSBG Act about the tripartite nature of the board. And I know in the field there are questions oftentimes about the one-third um, from the low-income sector. And is there any, someone's asking if there's any additional clarification um, in the standards around whether or not they need to be low-income consumers themselves or representatives of the low-income sector. And everything that I've seen so far, and correct me if I'm wrong, is that it's made to maintaining of the current CSBG Act where it needs to be a democratic selection process for that low-income sector. And oftentimes the spirit of the act is that it would be persons from low-income, the low-income community themselves. However, if they are democratically selected individuals and they live in the service area, is anything shifting in, in that interpretation? Uh, no, I mean, this is all still grounded in the language of the CSBG Act. We haven't, there's no changes there. If there is a place to be attentive, it's that um, within each uh, within each community that, that, that those criteria, the democratic selection, what that means uh, operationally, that, that it's, and then as those procedures are established, that they are uh, implemented and followed consistently. Uh, there are not, uh, so, we do uh, ask to ask that it, at the local level and within states that this expectation is revisited. There are places that are um, more uh, rigorous or will take this, uh, this requirement and are more operationally uh, explicit as to how they want to implement the, the, these requirements and others that are, are less. Uh, we think it's very important. This is sort of a hallmark of the CSBG uh, and the community action expectation is the involvement of low-income people in all aspects of the governance of the agency, the planning. And so look both to the spirit of the act and the expectations and the history of the, of the community action network and to the, the language has not changed in terms of what the, what the CSBG Act specifically requires. But we do ask states to take that, that element seriously and the boards and local agencies to be sure that they are, are attentive both to the spirit of the act and the uh, legal requirements. Thank you. Um, in terms of um, thresholds for collective action, um, I know that the IM talks a little bit about one of the questions that's come in that certainly we talk about the two ends of the spectrum. Mm -hmm. In this one or two, technical assistance doesn't seem to make sense. If there's criminal activity, that's the other end of the spectrum. Right. Um, do you have a sense, or is this going to be a state issue when they decide when to go into corrective action plan um, mode with an agency? Is, is, it, is it just one standard? Is it a couple? Or is that going to be up to states? Do you have a sense of that yet? Well, I would say just one, one kind of key point to, to mention, which is that if there is a, uh, if standards are communicated, they're established in contracts, established in state rules, and, and any other process, then they need to be, the expectation needs to be that agencies will ultimately meet 100% of the standards. So the goal is not, um, uh, and what we're basically indicating is that the model of, 
uh, approach should be, again, grounded in the spirit of the CSBG Act, that the first priority is if an agency is unable to meet a standard for one reason or another, the first uh, uh, priority is to assess whether uh, technical assistance is warranted and can um, feasibly help the agency meet the standard in a reasonable point of time. Um, the challenges come, and I think there are some, um, uh, you, you can't substitute for some of the uh, judgment that needs to take place in looking at if there are multiple widespread um, uh, uh, deficiencies, uh, if they've been communicated in the past, if they have, if opportunities have been provided for corrective action and those uh, opportunities have not been met. Uh, I would look to IM-116 for sort of some of those criteria. Uh, the state, if there is a place where a, um, there is still a criteria in the CSBG Act that will allow for a federal review if the state's uh, actions were capricious or, or somehow unreasonable. But generally, again, the, 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 the default is if there are uh, uh, items of deficiency, the first step is to move toward uh, immediate corrective action. And I will say that there should not, there's never a circumstance where any uh, standard that's not met, that there shouldn't be an effort to then uh, move to, to address the standard. Mm -hmm. It's the question of uh, when that reaches a tipping point at which the agency clearly is unable to um, meet the capacity of the community. and. Again, there's not a specific number that we've identified, uh, and uh, but as as we move forward with this, we will also begin, I think, to see sort of what uh, how the patterns work, and there should, there will be some learning as we go on this. Um, but there is no specific, there is no uh, uh, particular number that we've established or communicated, and states should have discussions with their network about that as well, and communicate expectations. Yes, great. Thank you. Um, when I first read the AIM, I figured this would be a triggered question. Um, it talks about OCS uh, can, is pursuing uh, to have legislative authority to have national standards. Can you talk a little bit about uh, what venue that's happening within, what the process might look like, is there a process for feedback? Do you have anything that you could share with the network on that aspect of, of things? Well, um, I think that has been, uh, for multiple years in our uh, presidential budgets and other, there has been the communication that that is uh, something that OCS is and ACF are, are pursuing or interested in. Uh, I think this is, again, you cannot have a discussion around this until the until part of the, the discussion has to be what are the standards that we're discussing. And we're now at a place where um, these have been made public, they're available, they're communicated, and uh, the there's an interest ultimately in, in some consistency. I think the idea that what gets implemented from one community to another, there's an interest in fairness and consistency and, and a standard that we can, that we, what we've said here is uh, the comprehensiveness, ultimately it's a responsibility to have standards communicated. States have that responsibility now um, and uh, the, uh, we will be continuing the dialogue uh, as and as we have opportunities to discuss um, how that can be, what would be the process to move forward with a more national uh, set of standards. But, you know, that's about as much as I could share at this point. There isn't, a, I think it's a, it's a, a conversation at this point, uh, um, and we answer questions, of course, as we, as we are given those opportunities as well. Great, thank you. And I think you may have referenced this in the beginning, but a, a couple of folks have asked. We have this draft I am here. We have a dear colleague that came out with some draft performance measures. Is there a plan to do one comprehensive I am at some point around all three? I know the dear colleague kind of references <coughs> where all three things are kind of coming at, at you know over the next few months. Is there a plan for one comprehensive I am, or are you looking at multiple? So we would. I, I'm trying to figure out whether we would call it the super I am <laughs> or an omni I am. The super omni I am. Oh, I like no, that. I, uh, no, I, at this point we don't have any. I think we would be. I think, frankly, that uh, we want to be communicating about things as they're ready and as they are fully vetted, and um, at a point that we uh, where we can move forward. Um, perhaps a couple of years down the line, once these, these each of these pieces have been established and. There may be ways to kind of integrate or re revisit that. But no, at this point, uh, we want to be, we don't want, we want to release the, you know, uh, products and materials as they're ready and fully vetted mm -hmm. uh, so that one element doesn't hold up another, et cetera. Uh, but 
No, there is no super I am or omni I am in the works yet. Ah, uh, the omni I am. <laughs> That's great. I like that. Um, all right. Um, we'll come back to questions, um, but I'd like to probably move a little bit further then into some how agencies can get prepared and some of the tools and resources, and then we'll come back to some more questions um, near the end. So why don't we uh, go on to the next slide then? So some of the next steps here, and um, Seth was just here referencing uh, the, the feedback is due on the 25th. The modify and release hopefully a, a final IM, and then working certainly with the Center of Excellence and other TA providers, other partners, uh, the state associations, our picks, uh, to really develop tools and resources to help agencies um, and states be ready for the rollout. Next slide. So at the, center, at the center of excellence here, kind of our work plan for the next six, eight months, um, tools and resources, although we're conscious that many tools already exist. We do hope to give agencies and states a guide that will link to each 56 of the 56 standards directly to tools and resources both within our network and outside our network to help agencies be prepared. We hope to draft additional written guidance. The Partnerships Board has talked about the need for the Center of Excellence to be drafting some more communications to the network. Certainly OCS will be doing that, but what can we do as the technical assistance provider to help agencies? Uh, we keep talking about a glossary or a definitions list um, that's still on our agenda to do that to try to improve consistency of interpretation as much as possible. We'll be doing a learning cluster for states on implementation under our Learning Communities Resource Center. Just met with a group yesterday um, trying to lay the groundwork of what that might look like, doing that in partnership with our friends at NASCAS uh, to make sure that states are having a chance to talk and dialogue with one another and share that draft language, share those best practices so we can, again, improve consistency. We're going to be doing and posting um, additional webinars on, on the various standards. We'll be doing a webinar that really takes each of the 56 or the, the, the nine big areas and, and talking about um, each of them individually so you can kind of have a plug and play for your boards and for your staff. And we're working with the states to hopefully track implementation as well. So how can you get ready as states associations and um, state CSPG offices? Um, the number one, I think, uh, re reflects what Seth was saying. Keep the lines of communication open um, across the organ uh, across the state with agencies, associations, and state offices. If I would, and I've been saying this from the field for, in a lot, for a while, quite a while now. If I was a CAF director, I would have a team of folks at my organization assessing. I know many of you have already gone down that road, which is great, uh, to assess where your organization stands against the standards and develop a work plan now, including standards in your strategic plans. Um, both at state level conversations and at agency level. I think uh, many of us a dialogue about strategic planning, so we want to make sure the standards are a piece of that. Work with your state associations to make sure conferences and training that's provided in some ways align with the organizational standards. And looking at my travel schedule this summer, I know many of you are doing that. I'm sure yours is as well, Seth, in the field quite a bit with folks, which is great. Um, include wrap up the standards in uh, CSPG work plans. We've encouraged at the NASCAP conference states to consider this as well. Where can agencies now begin to plug into CAP work plans and budgets, uh, ramping up to meet the standards, um, reviewing contract language and plans, and again, for states, certainly reviewing those rules and regulations. Go to the next slide. <laughs> We do have some draft tools up at the partnership site that help um, individual agencies, both public agencies and private agencies. Some simple assessment tools that have been out for a while, but it's always good to uh, remind the network. We have heard from folks in the field that they have used these or have modified them and have found them useful. So if we just go to the next slide. And this is just a picture of the, of the cover of the tool and go to the next one. So it's just not rocket science, it's just a one page per standard, you know, that helps agencies document where they're meeting the standard what tools, what minutes they're pulling out, what strategic plan pages they're using uh, to really help document that they are meeting the standard. We have a variety of toolkits, um, both within our organization, at CAP Law, NASCAP, a number of resources. One of the questions I get is, Denise, what, what about this risk assessment um, that agencies need to do? You'll see in the upper left-hand corner there, the Nonprofit Risk Management Center has worked with the partnership over the last two years. We have an online tool that is free and it now has been improved to directly link to template language to help agencies ramp up their risk assessment process, their risk policies. So while it's not a quick tool, um, it is a free tool uh, to help agencies kind of get to the, to the letter of the standard and help agencies really embrace the spirit of the standard. And again, CAP Law, we have a couple of their tools here. You can't beat the CAP Law Publications tab if you, if you go there. There's a ton of information there as well. 
All right. We also have a ton of webinars that um, plenty of places where you can listen to additional training. Just a picture of our website. Uh, left hand corner, you'll see we have a button for organizational standards enrollment update. We keep information there. There'll be a link to this recorded webinar there. Slide present, this slide presentation will be posted so you can use it with your own organization. The resources tab on the uh, right hand side, the green tab, is where you can find webinars, toolkits, um, curriculum, all sorts of good stuff. Let's go to the next slide. And also we have the CSBG TNCA Resource Center developed with CSBG resources and done in partnership with NASCAP that again has many more toolkits, resources, evidence-based practices, all sorts of good stuff. And we have just now, we're in the process, I, I think it may have gone live this week, we're working to de decouple. So just to access our consultant bank and our resource bank, you will no longer need to register with the site. It will be an easy click and easy, easy click and go, I guess, to the website. So that is close to launch. Yes, yay. <laughs> and again, here is our contact information here at the partnership. Please feel free to reach out. Um, email is a great way to reach out. Also take phone calls, you know, old school. Uh, feel free to reach out to us and we're happy to talk with you um, at any time. Anything before I go back to the Q&A window stuff that you'd like to add to that? Not right now, okay. Not right now, okay. All right, um, so let's take a look here. Let's go back to the chat window and I know that uh, we have people Something is falling on the call, so I know that the core components. Um, I want to make sure we try to get to as many questions as we can um, in the next 10 or 15 minutes or so. So, uh, let's see. We've gone through, I'm going back to the beginning, my apologies here. Um, public caps. Um, in Colorado, certainly we know public caps are the primary uh, caps in Colorado. They're, the boards have some certain challenges there um, in terms of the Board of County Commissioners in some cases, not the tripartite board making these decisions. Do you have any thoughts on things that we should be considering for public caps and the unique challenges that public caps may have? Certainly the, the proposed standards do try to address how public caps operate in terms of finance, HR, and the non-legal governance piece of the tripartite. Any thoughts that we should be thinking about um, as a network when we talk about public caps and standards? Well, no, uh, I think we've, uh, one thing that we, we did try, if there's only one difference at all really in the IM as far as how we even presented, and we did break out um, the public caps uh, from the, in terms of the standards. There are, there's a, there's an analogous standard for, for for nonprofits and public caps throughout the standards. Um, but I do think that, I guess I would encourage, particularly in states that there are a number of public caps, uh, or community action agencies, that they, that there be uh, convening and efforts to discuss those unique aspects to be assure input, recognize the intergovernmental nature of the, of the communications, um, and that, uh, that it not be sort of um, assumed that that's going to be just uh, kind of incorporated within the general uh, effort of standards. There are, I think, unique challenges. The structures are different. And uh, so we would encourage, uh, again, convening conference calls uh, and, and uh, particularly talking about that. And, and again, the relationships in some states, they have a large, particularly large number of public caps. In some cases, those public uh, community action agencies are large metropolitan jurisdictions. Uh, they, the, the government governance issues are, of course, very different, uh, but this is an opportunity to bring attention to, uh, within those uh, government entities, to the core values and the core requirements of CSBG and ensure that they are getting the attention that they require um, and that this is, uh, is truly being implemented in the, both the letter and spirit of the law. Great. Yeah. And I'm sure we'll be doing a lot more dialogue about, about some of those um, unique aspects of, of the public cap. But it, it is, it's ramping it up across, um, regardless of the type of, of community action eligible entity you are. Um, this came up actually this week at NASCA, at, um, at the Roma in Service as well. Um, the challenge for states when they are monitoring every three years, right, that's the requirement. But there's, you know, we, we talk about the expectation of all agencies meeting 100% of the standards. Mm -hmm. Any thoughts on how, I know things will be coming out and we'll be documenting this more thoroughly as we go forward through various other mechanisms, but how, any thoughts on how states, when they're monitoring a third of their agencies in 2016, for instance, and another in 2017, and another in 2018, and the expectations for all agencies to meet standards, any thoughts on how you navigate some of those um, just practical aspects? Um, 
Well, you know, I think that that's, uh, I, I think that like any kind of uh, standard that's being implemented, you, uh, you, you begin by communicating what's expected. You communicate it in contracts, you communicate it in other, in other mechanisms. And uh, yes, there's a expectation for a full on-site monitoring at least at, uh, once every three years, and that's the chance to go out and verify that everything is being done according to, uh, to all of the standards and, and any other requirements of the state. Uh, but that does not mean that there are not ways to um, periodically uh, check in, keep information, and, and frankly, um, you know, we, we never are able to check, we, we're not able to verify uh, expectations with every state every year that the expectations still stand and we go out and we do some verification and we ask people to report uh, otherwise on, on, on their activities and performance. So um, I wouldn't, I would say, you know, there will be, that will be, uh, there will have to be some integration of how um, perhaps there's a third of the states in, in any given year that can be fully, ver or a third of the local agencies that can be fully verified uh, according to the standards, but the expectation needs to be that everyone uh, is moving to meet them and and uh, and move forward. And I think that's important clarification. The expectation is 100%. Everybody needs to be meeting the standards. There's that check but verify legal piece. Um, but it's but if states are being able to find ways of in the intervening years for those agencies not getting mm -hmm. the official monitoring mm -hmm. to still assess against the 100%, mm -hmm. that's something that would be important for them to be thinking. About. And there are states that have done you know, created different designs mm -hmm. for how they, again it's. It's at least once every three years of full on-site monitoring. Uh, but there are states that have restructured structured that slightly differently, some that go out every year or have other kinds of uh, routine monitoring to, uh, or take the one aspect of the, uh, and look at it across all the agencies in a given year. So uh, yes, I think these are the questions that states need to be thinking about as far as the implementation, how this would work in practice, how you would communicate it to the agencies, and uh, and what they're, how you're going to verify and report on this. And that's where we also are open to hearing about what, you know, what would be, where it would be helpful to have any further clarification or what any concerns that are, are uh, come up in this process. Well, in the learning community, learning cluster for states on implementation, I'm sure we'll dialogue a lot about um, how that works, how that doesn't work, what are some of the bumps and what are the, some of the things that people can put into place to uh, try to get to the intent um, mm -hmm. uh, of, of the purpose behind all of this. So that's great. Thank you. Um, a specific question came in around strategic planning, um, but I think it goes to the broader question. I know in our proposal in July, we talked about could there not be several of the standards kind of having a delayed implementation because it may take longer to do a full strategic planning piece. With the kind of delay in terms of when things or people are going to need to report on that, I didn't see anything in the draft, I am. I haven't heard any standards kind of being put into that second wave or second tier. Right now, I'm seeing all of the standards needing to hit at the same time. Has the, is the, is, does the, the window of time here give us a chance to get ramped up so all the standards are coming in at the same time? Have you given thought to delaying some? Um, well, first, yeah, yes, I think, that, I think the time that we're asking for the formal reporting does give a lot, of, a lot of opportunity for looking at, when we talked about it in the IM about timelines, working with the agencies around timelines, that may, that may mean, it's, again, when, when is it reasonable to have information if something takes uh, if, if the nature of the standard is that it takes a certain amount of time, that can, that should be anticipated and built into the to the timelines. Uh, but you know, yes, the, the amount of time part of that is another aspect of. There's no reason to wait. There's no reason to that. Some of these things take uh, a long time to to be fully operational. So there's a sense. We hope there's a sense of urgency to begin moving forward now uh, in looking at. What will it take to make, put these standards into place within each agency, and what does the state need to have in terms of conveying expectations on timeline, rules, and, um, and monitoring efforts? Okay. Um, and one, I know we have a couple other questions here, but I, I, I am conscious of folks' time. But um, I know one came in, and it's been something we've had in the field a lot, is in terms of the difference between the organizational standards and the standards of excellence uh, that the partnership also um, promotes and you know produces and, and we know many of you have gone through the Pathways program. We just want to reiterate here, we are talking about organizational standards being separate from the standards of excellence. The standards of excellence are kind of really are a very high level, Baldridge level, um, excellence level, which is a very high bar for agencies to meet. Um, the organizational standards are meant to be that good governance, good practice, good HR, good management, good leadership, 
um, and encompassing the values of community action, that really is to set the bar. It's not, it's not uh, the standards of excellence. So I just wanted to make one more reiteration on that. Um, give conscious of people's time. Um, I would encourage you that if you have additional questions to email me at dharlow at communityactionpartnership.com. But I think we do want to wrap up uh, today's webinar. I think we've hit a lot of the core questions. And again, if there are questions, please don't hesitate to send them to me by email, and we will do our best to answer them. And I know we've had some other specific kind of questions uh, that, are, um, that we can address separately, and we'll be in touch. If you don't get your question answered, please don't hesitate to, to, to email me. Do you have any uh, final words or comments? No, I think we're, um, we, again, we look forward to receiving comments. And just to, just to remind that um, on, all the, on our website, uh, we have all the Dear Colleague messages that have uh, been communicated. The most recent one will be, po will be posted shortly. Uh, but we encourage you to, there are links for where you can provide your comments. We are, today is the date for the state and federal accountability measures uh, to be submitted to Urban Institute. There is a link on our website for how to submit those. And uh, we are taking all of that input very seriously. Uh, we review it thoroughly and, it, and, uh, and in many cases it has improved the products. This process has, has led to much better products than we would have had otherwise. And so we want to keep that uh, momentum going and appreciate your involvement. Great. Thank you, Seth. And we did have a, a chat come in from Tom Tenorio, our board president, saying thank you uh, to OCS to getting the information out sooner rather than later. And, and so we have a chance to think and talk about it and, and be ready to, to go um, right. when the time comes. So uh, thank you, everyone, for being on today's webinar. This webinar will be posted at the Partnerships website. We will also have the slides in slide format, so you will be able to use them with your own boards, with your own staff. And again, please send me questions, and we will do our best to get back to you um, with an answer. So again, thank you very much, folks. We look forward to seeing you in the field and on future uh, update webinars. Take care, thanks, and have a great day.